Okay, so we're now entering the final phase in Jewish history. That's the one we're in right now. And just to do a little review, phase one is the development of Jewish civilization. That's us in the ancient world. It takes us all the way up until the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans and the beginning of the Long Exile. Phase two is the Middle Ages, where we have religious persecution and economic hardship, which is going to be very difficult to survive through these two forms of pressure. Phase three is the Enlightenment. Now the pressure's off for the first time as we're granted equal rights, and we might now just assimilate away into the non-Jewish world and join the other nations as they're being formed, and we'll no longer exist as a distinct national entity, which leads us to phase four, which we call the modern era in Israel, where we realize that we'll never gain acceptance in anybody else's land, and therefore, in large part, we end up back in the land of Israel, establishing our own independent state. And I pointed out at the beginning of the course that what happened during the Enlightenment leads specifically to the establishment of the State of Israel. So I want to understand first what happened that leads to this major transition in our history where we go through tumultuous change because of the Holocaust and then getting out of exile after 2,000 years and establishing ourselves back in our own land. What was the nature of this transition? Okay, I'm going to put a blue line between phase three and phase four. Because in order to get a better understanding of what's going to happen here, it's best if we get a sense of the makeup of the Jewish people just at this transition point. So there are really two different types of Jews. On one hand, we have traditional Jews. These are the Jews at this point who see themselves in a long line of Jews who've been in exile ever since the Roman exile, the destruction of the Second Temple. And Jews throughout the ages have been hoping and praying to eventually get back to the land of Israel over this 2,000-year period. To them, getting back to the land of Israel is a return to the covenantal land, meaning the land of Israel is the basis of our covenant with God to be his nation and to be a light to the other nations. On the other hand, we have the Enlightenment Jews, which we spoke about. They saw great new opportunity in the nations that they're living in, and therefore, from their perspective, they didn't see themselves being in exile. Right? Their goal was to prove loyalty to their non-Jewish counterparts that they could be trusted as good and loyal citizens of the state. So from their mindset, they had no desire to go back to Israel because Israel was no longer significant because they didn't see the Jewish people as being a nation. We were, at best, a religion. But what happened was, amongst the Enlightenment Jews, is that many of them began to lose hope because of anti-Semitism. And as much as they tried to prove and be like their non-Jewish neighbors, it didn't matter. They lost the trust and the non-Jews feared them, and we spoke about that with the rise of anti-Semitism. So what were they going to do with their dream of the Enlightenment when they're not living in a nation that's going to accept them as their own. So as a result, they became nationalistic. Because remember, the Enlightenment is an age of nationalism. All these nations are being born and people are excited about France and Germany and Italy. And so the Jews were saying, well, they're getting excited by their nation. So why don't we get excited by our own nation and our own land? And therefore their hearts turned to going back to the land of Israel. But to them, it was not to return to a covenantal land. It was to build some type of new Jewish state built on the Enlightenment ideals, so it could be a nation amongst the nations, but it could be a Jewish nation. It could be specifically for the Jews, a home that really could be a home and really be safe and secure for the Jewish people finally after 2,000 years of living amongst such insecurity. And therefore, there's going to be competing visions amongst the Jewish people in terms of what the land of Israel means to the Jews and what is its place amongst all the different nations. So now to get a better understanding of what led to the formation of the state of Israel, let's take a look at one of the most famous Enlightenment Jews who in large part was responsible for the establishment of the Jewish people back in their land, Theodor Herzl. Now, if you had to think of the least likely candidate to be the one responsible in large part for the establishment of the Jewish people back in their homeland, it would have to be Theodor Herzl. He was born and raised in Hungary, and then later his family moved to Vienna. His parents were both assimilated, and when it came time for his bar mitzvah, he didn't get one. Instead, he had a confirmation. And in general, he was raised with a natural disdain for religion. He was more of a Jew raised with the German humanist culture. So he was your model Enlightenment Jew. This is not someone who's raised with a lot of tradition and, you know, singing Shana Habab Yushalayim next year in Jerusalem around the Passover Seder. So he ends up studying law, but later he decides that he wants to use his writing talents as a journalist. So he becomes a journalist in Vienna. And then as a correspondent in Paris, he covers the Dreyfus Affair, which we covered in the previous video, but where a Jew was wrongly accused of betraying the French military by passing over secrets to the Germans. Many historians say that this is one of the major reasons why Herzl began to rethink 
the position of the Jews amongst the nations. Because he said, witnessing the Dreyfus affair, where he heard the French saying, you know, death to the Jews, throw them into the river Seine. He said, if this is happening in France, which is the home of the Enlightenment, and they're yelling death to the Jews, then there really is no place in the world that's secure for the Jewish people other than their own homeland. So he comes to the conclusion that it's really futile to fight anti-Semitism. He wrote a play called The New Ghetto because he realized, you know, the Enlightenment Jews thought they had gotten out of the ghetto and here they were free. But in fact, they were really living in a ghetto where there were still walls of hatred that they had to deal with that weren't coming down. He eventually wrote his seminal work called Der Judenstaat, which means the Jewish state, where he lays out his vision for the Jewish people in their own homeland. That was in 1896. And with that, his fame spread, which ultimately resulted in him becoming the father of modern day Zionism. Now, I want to point out there were other Jews who had already been speaking about the idea of going back to the land of Israel and Zionism. But he, with his stature, with his charisma, with his talents, he really became a tour de force in the movement. The next year, in 1897, he convenes the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. He wanted the Congress to meet in Munich, but the Jews of Munich were very assimilated. And they were the last thing they wanted was for Jews to proclaim their interest in going back to Israel. Here they are trying to prove that to their German counterparts that they're really loyal citizens and they don't want Jews saying, no, we're really going back to Israel. You had 204 delegates from around the world that came of every stripe and every sense, religious, not religious, from different countries. And this created real stir for the Enlightenment Jews because, again, this is the last thing they wanted was to have Jews saying, no, we're planning to go back and want to reestablish ourselves in the land of Israel when they're busy trying to prove their loyalty to their fellow citizens. Herzl was elected president of the Congress, and he had tried to galvanize support and came up with different ideas. In fact, one of the ideas which was very controversial is that he actually considered Uganda as a homeland. Now, if they couldn't get Israel, so let's move somewhere else. And that created a lot of controversy and heartache, and really, um, they say, ultimately killed him. He died from a heart attack later on. He met with world leaders. He met with the Pope. In fact, in his diary, he writes about his audience with the Pope trying to convince him to allow the Jews to go back to Israel, which the Pope does not consent to. But he works on getting influential people behind the movement. And that's why he becomes known really as the father of modern day Zionism. Sadly for him, he died before realizing his dream. He died at the age of 44 in the year 1904. Okay, so let's do a little review. So here we are, we're entering phase four, which is the modern era and Israel. The Jewish people realize there's no place like home uh, for the most part. And therefore, what happens in phase three directly leads to what happens in phase four. We're looking at the Jewish people, the situation, the two different types of Jews that were at this moment, the traditional Jews who've gone through the long exile waiting to go home. And for them, it's returning to their covenantal land. That would be the idea. And then we have the Enlightenment Jews who are born at a time of nationalism where they thought that wherever they were living that was really their true homeland and they didn't feel they were in exile right they thought they were really at home until anti-semitism increases and they realize it's not going to happen so they come up with an idea of creating a new type of jewish state because they don't have the connection to tradition they really felt they were much more progressive uh they're going to come up with the idea which clearly is going to be zionism within the land of israel and the father of that is theodore herzl as we said, he's raised in Hungary, then Vienna, assimilated parents, didn't get a bar mitzvah. He had disdain for religion and Judaism. And he was basically your typically enlightened Jew. He studied law, but becomes a journalist. And it's in Paris that he covers the Dreyfus affair, and he's shocked by the anti-Semitism that he sees there. He begins to rethink the position of the Jews amongst the nations. He realizes it's futile to fight anti-Semitism, and he writes a play called The New Ghetto, and his great seminal work is Der Judenstadt. Then the next year, in 1897, he convenes the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. There are 204 delegates. He's elected president. At one point, when he realizes it might not be able to get Israel, he thinks about Uganda. He meets with world leaders, including the Pope, and he really becomes the father of modern-day Zionism. He dies at the age of 44.